join me in one more moment of prayer? Almighty Father, we are never more privileged than when we come together with your word open in front of us and your spirit in our hearts. We pray that this evening you will enable us to use these gifts to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you so much for your welcome. I'm delighted to be back here in Pepperdine, even though my body clock is telling me that it's about 3.30 in the morning. So in my tradition, we have an old story about the priest who dreamt he was preaching a sermon and woke up to find that it was true. And, and, I, I'm always glad to come back to Southern California. Last time, my wife and I were here and we went whale watching, and I was glad last night to see some humpback whales just close off the shore. That was delightful. The last time my wife and I went, we were told that we would see mothers and babies returning north after the breeding season further south. Well, we watched for hours, and we saw about a thousand dolphins, but the only whale we saw wasn't a mother or baby heading north, but an elderly male heading south. <laughs> I, I like that old guy. He, he was a symbol of hope. The, the last time I was at Pepperdine, which amazingly was 11 years ago, it's gone very quickly, I found myself speaking at one point, not in this auditorium, but somewhere else, a large rake of seats, and it seemed to contain something like the whole student body, and they were clearly there on sufferance because the professor introducing the session told them sharply to put away their newspapers and to turn off their computers, and I realized I was going to have to work hard to keep this captive audience from getting bored or restless so I deliberately increased the pace and energy levels of my talk and I thought I'd got away with it until that evening when Maggie was on the phone home to one of our children and I heard her say with a mixture of distaste and disdain oh your father went into his Pentecostal preacher mode <laughs> about as damning a comment as you could imagine <laughs> Except, except my, my favorite in that genre, and I have this cartoon on the wall of my study at home. Uh, a bishop and his wife are driving away from church, and the bishop is saying, have you considered how much more effective my sermon would have been if you hadn't shouted, ha? So there we are. One more word of introduction. I've told I ought to say this. In an attempt to stay home more and travel less, I've been developing a series of online courses on the New Testament and its meaning for today. And the people who organized this for me told me I should tell you tonight that uh, if you're interested, you'll find them at ntwriteonline.org, www.ntwriteonline.org. Now, end of advertisement. Anyway, um, my task this week, and tonight in particular, is to tell you a love story, a love story which we've been singing about, did e'er such love and sorrow meet? We all know this story, but like a Shakespeare play, it has more depth and meaning every time we hear it. In fact, like several Shakespeare plays, and perhaps this is why those plays are so powerful, it has to do with the combination of love and death, the strongest forces in the world. And this is the story in whose light we are this week committing ourselves to live. We need to remind ourselves just how strange it is that within a few years of Jesus' death, people were telling the story of his crucifixion in several different ways with the themes always converging on love. We, we kind of take this for granted. We sing about it, we read prayers about it, we know the story, but we should be shocked by it. Crucifixion, after all, was common under Rome's rule, and the idea of treating a crucifixion as a love story was unthinkable. When the slave rebellion of Spartacus was put down in 71 BC, the authorities crucified 6,000 rebels all along the road between Rome and Capua. That's roughly the same distances from here to San Diego and roughly one cross every 40 paces. Imagine it. 
Then again, thousands of young Jews were crucified around the time Jesus was born for staging a rebellion. And thousands more again when Jerusalem was under siege in 69 and 70 AD. Jesus of Nazareth lived and died in a cross-shaped and cross-haunted world. But in no other case did anyone dream of saying, on the cross he defeated the principalities and powers. Obviously that wasn't true. Or, the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. When you're looking at a crucifixion, what's that about? Nobody said, oh, he died for my sins in accordance with the scriptures. Nobody said, looking at any of those thousands of crucifixions, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. We need to be shocked anew by the ridiculous fact that so soon after Jesus' death, people were saying this kind of thing. And they were living in a radically new way as a result. And when, as modern or postmodern Western Christians, we try to sum up what we believe about the cross and to preach it and teach it, not least to our own rebellious hearts, this shock of historical reality ought to kickstart a process of reflection way beyond the standard, rather tired formulations that we can all say so well. The Bible has far more to say about the meaning of the cross, I suspect, than any of us have begun to glimpse. The trouble is, to say it simply, to put a card on the table, is that for a great many Western Christians today, the meaning of the cross that they think they've heard is, not God so loved the world that he gave his son, but God so hated the world that he killed his son. Now here we face a problem. I know of no theologian or preacher who's actually said that, though some may have come close. But I find that this is what many ordinary folk in churches think they are hearing. This is how the story comes across. However much theologians insist that the cross is the supreme act of divine love, many Christians think that they're supposed to believe that it happened because God hated us. And the gospel story is told again and again in the radically oversimplified fashion of we sinned, God was going to kill us, Jesus got in the way, so that's all right now. And the problem is not just that this leaves a bad taste in many people's mouths, so that many turn away from any suggestion of penal substitution, despite the fact that it is clearly taught in Scripture. The problem is that this radically shrinks what the New Testament actually says and what the four Gospels themselves say. And if you treat one part of the truth as the whole, it becomes an untruth. So how do we rightly tell the story of Jesus' crucifixion? And how do we rightly live that story as the New Testament tells us to? And how in particular do we make sense of the extraordinary thing which the Bible insists on, that by 6 p.m. on Good Friday, the world was a different place? It isn't just that when Jesus died, a new possibility of people getting to heaven had opened up. In fact, that isn't the point at all. On the cross, Paul declared, Jesus disarmed the principalities and powers and made a public example of them, celebrating a triumph over them. How do we cope with this language of a one-off victory, especially as it seems to many that nothing really changed that day. The world went on the same as before. Or did it? Now, to help us get at this question, I want to look briefly with you tonight at John chapter 13. You know the scene. If you've got a Bible, fine. If you haven't, you know the story, I'm sure. It's where Jesus washes the feet of the disciples after their last meal. It's a vivid and moving scene, but it's got many more dimensions than might appear at first glance. Let me do, let's look at them together. First, John places this scene as the start of the long build-up to the cross. We've got another six chapters to go before Jesus is crucified, but this is the beginning of that. Jesus has come to Jerusalem for the last time. Everything we've read in John so far indicates that this is the moment of confrontation, of victory, of the completion of Jesus' kingdom work. But instead of Jesus marching into the temple or confronting the authorities, as he'd done in chapter 2, he takes his followers to the upper room 
and he shares with them in acted symbol, in parable, in warning, in comfort, instruction, the secret of what is about to happen. John will not portray the crucifixion until he has enabled us to see what it might mean. He wants us to see these chapters as the true temple with Jesus and his followers standing for a moment at the dangerous intersection of heaven and earth. And over all that is to come, John opens this chapter with these wonderful words, having loved his own who were in the world, Jesus loved them to the end, to the uttermost. There was nothing that love could do for them that love did not do, and this is how. Jesus is enabling them to stand at this place of heaven and earth coming together by purifying them for God's presence. They need to be washed to have a full share in his life. He says to Peter, if I don't wash you, you don't have any part with me. The foot washing story, though, follows the pattern of the famous poem in Philippians chapter 2, where Jesus did not regard his equality with God as something to exploit, but emptied himself, died the slave's death on the cross, and was then exalted. Here in John, Jesus removes his outer garments and acts the part of the slave to cleanse the disciples. Then he gets dressed again and tells them that as he is their Lord, they must follow his example. The foot washing then is clearly an acted parable, deliberately done to show what Jesus is about to accomplish. And indeed, what the whole story of the gospel, the incarnation and death, and resurrection is all about. Jesus has laid aside the garments of heaven to reveal his glory on the cross, cleansing his followers so that they can be part of God's new temple, the microcosm of God's new creation. That's what the temple is. But within the story of the foot washing, there comes a dark and dangerous note. The Satan, the accuser, has already put it into Judas's heart to betray Jesus. Judas will be the accuser's mouthpiece, embodying and enacting the great accusation, the anti-God, anti-creation, anti-human force, which is at large in the world. You recall how at the start of Mark's gospel, the minute Jesus begins to announce that God is becoming king, the demons start shrieking at him in the synagogue. So here, as Jesus prepares for what is to come, in this moment of deep intimacy, the Satan is at work. John 13 has this almost unbearable tension of celebration and love and diabolical preparation. The powers of evil are gathering for one last desperate attempt to thwart the divine rescue operation. As Jesus says in Luke 22, this is your hour and the power of darkness. Now all this is part of the larger theme that runs through the second half of John's Gospel. In chapter 12, Jesus is faced with the Greeks at the feast, and he looks beyond them to the new moment in the divine plan when the great victory is to be won, which will enable the nations of the world to be freed from their slavery and to worship the true God. And he says, now is the judgment of this world. Now is the ruler of this world cast out. And if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. And this sense of final confrontation of the kingdom of God against the kingdom of the Satan increases through the farewell discourses in chapters 13 to 17 until we see Jesus confronting Pontius Pilate, the kingdom of God against the kingdom of Caesar, and arguing with him over kingdom and truth and power before, in the crowning irony of the gospel, Pilate loses the argument by sending Jesus to be crucified. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, the rulers of this age did not know what they were doing, otherwise they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. They were signing their own death warrant. 
Anyway, after the foot washing and after Judas has gone out into the dark, Jesus tells the disciples with a sense of excitement that God is going to be glorified at last and that they must learn to love one another as he has loved them. Glory and love, two great Johannine and indeed Pauline themes. But how is God then glorified? Through the work of his Son, the true divine image, the genuinely human one, the Word became flesh and tabernacled in our midst, and we gazed upon his glory as of the Father's only Son. This then, think of the Old Testament background to this. This is what it looks like when the glorious divine presence returns to Jerusalem at last. When the watchmen shout with joy because Israel's God is becoming king. This is what it looks like when Babylon is overthrown. And all the way back when Pharaoh's hosts are overthrown in the Red Sea and the slaves are set free. This is what it looks like when the servant is exalted and lifted up so that kings will shut their mouths because of him. This is what it looks like when the scriptures are fulfilled. And this is why when John tells the story of the new Eden in chapter 20, the resurrection chapter, there is no serpent to be seen. Mary is weeping, but Jesus tells her to dry her tears. The disciples are afraid, but Jesus comes through locked doors and tells them not to fear. Thomas doubts and questions, but Jesus answers him and accepts his newfound faith and worship. New creation can now happen because the power of the Satan, of Babylon, of Pharaoh has been broken. This is how the story works. That is what is different by 6 p.m. on Good Friday, though they don't realize it till the third day, which is the first day of the week, the start of God's new world. This is the story John is telling. It is, he says, Passover time. The first Christians knew that Jesus had chosen Passover as the proper frame in which his death would mean what it had to mean. Judas energized by the Satan is like the hard-hearted Pharaoh who won't let Israel go so that when the victory comes it will be decisive and final and the love the uttermost love which Jesus pours out is the sharp focus of that ancient covenant love which had promised to Abraham that his seed would be freed and given their inheritance and which then came down to Egypt to rescue them. This is the new exodus. This is the new tabernacle where God dwells with his people. And therefore it is also the new Torah, a new commandment I give you to love one another as I have loved you. This is Passover. The people who are rescued by the cross and the love which it reveals will be shaped by the cross and the love which it will reveal through them to the world. By this, says Jesus, will all know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And this is how we learn not only to tell the Jesus story, but also to live the Jesus story. There is a straight line from here to Jesus' commissioning of the disciples in the upper room in, at the resurrection, and then particularly to his recommissioning of Peter in John 21, because there is a, a poignant tailpiece at the end of John chapter 13. Peter realizes Jesus is going to a place of great danger, and he declares, I will follow you wherever you go, and I will give my life for you. And there is a gentle irony in Jesus' reply. Will you lay down your life for me? Actually, Peter, in an hour or two, you'll find you're part of the problem, not part of the solution. <laughs> but with all of this, the complex musical lines of the story, the love, the glory, the satanic attack, they're brought together into the single great chord, dark and glorious, which heralds the unveiling of divine love. So here in John 13, in a passage which is narrative, not dogma, we have all the elements of the Christian understanding of the cross. 
We have the cleansing from sin, which allows access to the divine presence. We have the ultimate defeat of evil, with the Satan doing its worst and being overthrown. We have the example of self-giving love to be followed so that the world may believe. And we have the sharply personal challenge, will you do this for me? Actually look to yourself and be thankful that I will do it for you. And with this with all this, we lift up our eyes and we realize that when the New Testament, <coughs> excuse me, when the New Testament tells us the meaning of the cross, it gives us not a system but a story, not a theory but a meal and an act of humble service, not a celestial mechanism for punishing sin and taking people to heaven, but an earthly story of a human Messiah who embodies and incarnates Israel's God and who unveils his glory in bringing the kingdom to earth from heaven. The Western church, and we've all gone along with this, has been so concerned with getting to heaven, with sin as the problem in the way, and therefore has stressed about how to remove sin and its punishment so that it has jumped straight to passages in Paul which can be made to serve that purpose and has forgotten that the Gospels are replete with atonement theology through and through. Only they give it to us, not in a neat little system, but in a powerful, sprawling, many-sided, but richly revelatory narrative in which we are invited to find ourselves, or rather to lose ourselves and be found again the other side. We have gone paddling in the shallow, stagnant waters of medieval questions and answers, taking care to put on the right shoes and not lose our balance or slip about, when outside the window is the vast and dangerous ocean of the gospel story, inviting us to plunge in and let the wild waves of dark glory wash us, wash over us, wash us through and through and land us on the shores of God's new creation. Because that is what John's story is all about. You will know, we sang it, that in John 19, Jesus, as he dies, says, tetelestai, it is finished. I was brought up to think that he was using the word you'd use if a bill was being paid. It's been paid, finished, done. I was brought up to think that this was the account being settled. The price has been paid, the punishment has been meted out, sins are forgiven. Behind that neat little transactional meaning, there looms the bright shadow of a different reality altogether. From the start of John's Gospel, we know that this book is about the new beginning, the new Genesis. In the beginning was the Word, and now on day six, Friday, it is finished. The Creator God finished His work on the sixth day, and now the same God finishes on the sixth day the work of rescuing that creation. The redeeming task is complete, and on the seventh day God will rest in the tomb. And then the new week will begin, the new creation in which the renewed humans, through their tears and their fears and their doubts, will be commissioned to be agents of that renewal through the Spirit, through the forgiving or retaining of sins, through feeding the sheep, through following Jesus, even when it means suffering and death themselves, through loving one another as he has loved them, through living by the cross as they were saved by the cross. The world changed that day and the Spirit-led work and witness of Jesus' followers puts that change into operation. How many Christians does it take to change a light bulb? The answer is, Jesus has already changed it. And it's your job, it's your job to go and switch it on. The way the Western Church Excuse me. The way the Western Church has clung on to the narrative of sin and punishment as though this was the whole story 
represents a dramatic downsizing, a belittling of the vast achievement of the cross and the wonderful story through which the Gospels showcase it. Don't misunderstand me. I am not saying, some people have accused me of this, I am not saying that sin doesn't matter or that forgiveness doesn't matter. Far from it. I am certainly not saying that the New Testament has no doctrine of penal substitution, because it does. But we have put that teaching in the wrong framework. In Scripture, these themes are held not within a moralistic narrative of simply, I got it wrong, God punished Jesus, that's all right, but within the much greater narrative framework of the Creator's loving purposes for the whole creation. And within that, the vocation of humans is not just to behave ourselves, not just to accumulate righteousness by our works or when that proves impossible by the works of another. The human vocation is for us to be image bearers, the royal priesthood, to reflect the praises of creation to the creator and the loving wisdom of the creator into his world. And sin and forgiveness matter <coughs> Sin and forgiveness matter because humans need to be set free to be humans, to be image bearers within the ongoing purposes of God. When the heavenly choir in Revelation 5 sing the praises of the lion who is also the lamb, they praise him because by his blood he ransomed humans for God to make them a royal priesthood. There is a task to be done way beyond simply me being right with God, though that matters, and quite different from going to heaven, which isn't the point, since the gospel, like the book of Revelation, is about heaven coming to earth. Let me tell you what I think it's like when we highlight the cross simply in terms of punishing sin. Imagine a wonderfully gifted musician who was on the verge of playing concertos at the highest level, but who's suddenly been caught out in a crime for which he'll serve many years in jail. And then suddenly, the word comes of a general amnesty. What will he think? He won't just think, oh, what a relief, I don't have to go to jail. He'll think, at last, I will be able to play the music like I've never played it before. We in the Western church have often forgotten the music we were meant to be playing, and we can only think of whether or not we're going to jail. John's gospel is about the music, the music of new creation, the music which, of course, needs the musicians to be released from their bondage in order to play it, but which means a thousand things beyond the mere cancellation of punishment. So how does it all fit together? How can we explore and celebrate and then live out the cruciform message of the powerful, victorious love of God? I'm going to be exploring this, and other speakers are going to be exploring this this week. The sessions that I'm doing will be looking in more detail at some key biblical passages. But I think as a frame for that, we need to recognize the problem that we have dug ourselves into. First, and bear with the technical language, we have Platonized our eschatology. That is shorthand for the fact that we have thought of going to heaven was the ultimate goal, and we've seen heaven as a world of disembodied bliss, period. A world where resurrection bodies would struggle to find a purpose. It's time to re-embrace the biblical vision of new heavens and new earth, and of renewed human life within it, which started at Easter and with Pentecost. But second, that wrong vision of the ultimate goal of a disembodied platonic immortality plays back into how we see ourselves as human beings. We've narrowed everything down to morality, to whether we've kept the rules or not and what happens when we haven't. Again, that matters, but it matters as one focal point within the much larger human vocation. To think only about that is to risk repeating the sin of Adam and Eve, making the knowledge of good and evil the center of attention. Think about it. Thus we have Platonized our eschatology and have therefore moralized our anthropology. Lots of ologies for you tonight. <laughs> and as a result, third, 
we have paganized our soteriology. We have offered to the world a parody of the gospel in which an angry God punishes an innocent victim. We have put the Bible's teaching about Jesus dying in our place and for our sins within the wrong story, the pagan story you find among the Greeks and the Romans. And these three things go together. A wrong vision of the goal, a wrong analysis of the plight, or shrunken analysis of the plight, a wrong view of salvation. They breed their own reactions, which can be equally damaging. There's a lot of that around at the moment. No. The Messiah, the, the New Testament insists that the Messiah died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, not in accordance with the late medieval view of heaven and hell and with a few scriptural texts thrown in. <laughs> we must stop giving 19th century answers to 16th century questions and try to give 21st century answers to 1st century questions. All the perspectives will shift if we do this. And when we put the scriptural narrative in the, as that framework, we will find that Passover, Jesus' own choice of interpretative framework, will make sense. Because in the Second Temple period, that great hoped-for final Passover would also be the forgiveness of sins. Read Isaiah 40 to 55 or Daniel 9. This would be the moment when God's people would be set free from their long exile and the news of God's love would go out into the world. Here is the key and clue to it all, just very briefly, and I'll try to explore this later on this week. The powers which have ruled the world and which still lure millions into idolatry and sin, the powers, the principalities and powers, gain their power precisely because humans, God's image bearers, give it to them when they worship them. That's what idolatry does. It hands over our proper human power to alien powers, and they maintain that grip through our sin. But when sins are forgiven, the grip of the powers is broken. We must not play off the theme of victory against the theme of forgiveness or indeed substitution. They work together. Jesus died, John 13, to cleanse his people from their sins and thereby to break the power of the Satan. And by 6 p.m. on Good Friday, it's done. And at Easter, the chains are broken, not only the chains of sin and death, but the chains in which the nations have been held captive. God's new creation has been launched, and over the gateway there stands the word forgiveness. And we go like the surprised and excited disciples to love one another with that cruciform love. To confront the powers of the world, it's dangerous. We will suffer, but we confront them with the news of the victory of love. We go to declare to the world that we have gazed upon that glory full of grace and truth. And in our work of foot washing and all that it symbolizes in a world of pain and poverty, to show that forgiveness and reconciliation and peacemaking and justice bringing at every level are the instrument of new creation. This will mean suffering, and that's part of the deal. That's how it works. Jesus loved his own who were in the world, and he loved them to the end. And by his Spirit, he puts that same cross-shaped love into our hearts and hands and sends us out to celebrate that love and to bring it to birth once more, often through our own pain in his world. He said, whoever receives one whom I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. There can be no greater calling than this, because there can be no greater love. And that, my friends, is our privilege and our joy. Let's join in prayer for a moment. Gracious Lord, our hearts are full of amazement and gratitude for all that you did for us. We thank you for your love, loving us to the uttermost. We thank you for your victory over all the dark powers of the world. We thank you for your new creation beckoning us now because we've been set free. We thank you for our fresh vocation 
to live in your world, shaped by your cross, to reveal your glory. Give us grace and strength this week to take this in, to pray it in, and then to live it out. For your own name's sake we ask. Amen.